Do you have insomnia or identify as a person who has trouble sleeping? For many people, feeling tired is a way of life. We think we can't sleep, so we don't sleep. And we develop bad habits to cope with our exhaustion, relying on caffeine and other stimulants to keep going, and skimping on our workouts and healthy eating because we don't have the energy, and then scrolling on our phones and watching television when we can't fall asleep because we're assuming that sleep is some magical event that just happens to lucky people. But sleep is actually a skill. You learned it as a baby and then unlearned it as a busy, stressed out adult. Today, I'm talking to Helen Cernet. She's the host of the hit podcast, Sleep Lists, which she launched after recovering from insomnia herself. And in this episode, you're going to learn how sleep impacts your mental health and how your mental health impacts your sleep and why your brain turns on instead of off when you get into bed. We're also going to discuss the thinking habits that keep you awake so that you can walk away with a realistic expectation for what it takes and how long it takes to cure insomnia. My name is Colleen Cashman. I'm a soberish recovery coach helping high achieving women get emotionally sober so that drinking less or not at all feels like a superpower. Join me each week for evidence-based holistic strategies to regulate your brain chemistry and nervous system and also develop a growth mindset so you can feel proud, confident, and resilient with or without a drink in your hand because it's not about the alcohol. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be back. If you're a regular listener, you may have noticed that I didn't post my usual two episodes last week. And that is because I was taking my own advice and letting some of the balls drop and giving myself some space to breathe. If you're following the show, you know that I'm in the process of a divorce, and last week was the big split where my soon-to-be ex-husband moved out of our home. He's moving across the country to Montana, and so a couple of our kids were packing up and going with his big caravan. And meanwhile, me and my daughters were left to clean and purge and shift rooms and offices and get used to being on our own. And as ready as I am to begin this next chapter, it was emotional. There's over a decade of memories in this house and having to process my feelings as I'm changing out pictures and trying to update my space was a bit overwhelming. I was talking to my own coach about what I was going through and she labeled what I was going through as grief which I found interesting because, you know, I'm so ready for this. I'm doing this. This is what I want. I'm the one that initiated the divorce. And yet here I am having feelings that don't make sense. And before I touch on the grief portion, I just want to put into context the feelings like it would be weird if I didn't have feelings. There is no course of action ever that doesn't include the whole rainbow of emotions. And it's been really nice to spend time with my kids and even my ex-husband before he left, acknowledging how painful this is. And not because we're hating or demonizing each other, but because we're acknowledging that there was a lot of good. And the only way I can walk away with untarnished memories that I can cherish for the rest of my life is to allow the ending to hurt. The alternative would be to fuel myself with anger and righteous indignation and justifications for my own behavior and bypass that pain. But honestly, that's not really fun either. I'd rather be smiling through my tears. And that was what I was talking about with my coach with grief. I was surprised that I was experiencing grief when she labeled it as that. And she has lost a child, so she's kind of an expert on grief. And she was talking about how a huge part of any relationship is actually just the mental construct, your identity within that relationship, who you think you are, who you think they are, and who you think we are together. 
And when I get really honest about my relationship with my ex-husband, a lot of it was based on projections. And the conflict in our relationship was mostly due to the fact that my reality didn't match his reality. And I'm grieving because as I walk around our home and look at all the pictures, all the trips we've taken over the years and the adventures we've had together, when I look at the picture, I realize that I loved the idea of us more than the actual experience. I think especially in this day and age, it's very easy to fall in love with your pictures. We have thousands of images of pretty, smiling, happy people and beautiful locations. And a large part of my identity was who I thought the woman in the picture was. And the reason it was time for me to go was the cost of being her was too high. And now I have to let go of who I thought I was and who we were together so that I can allow this new version of myself to emerge. And as I don't have any pictures of her on the beach or in the mountains yet, that's pretty scary. And so for the first time in my life, instead of hurrying up to create something new, I'm going to slow my roll and just allow myself to be in that uncomfortable place of transition and uncertainty instead of rushing to fill it with some new mental construct that's really just an emotional reaction to the one I just rejected. So while I'm still going to come to work, I'm also taking space and time to heal and both figuratively and literally let the dust settle. And before we dive into the episode, I will mention that I am also still doing a live masterclass this Thursday on alcohol use disorder. If you're newer to the podcast, my business is a group coaching program called The Next Chapter, and I work with high achieving professional women to reduce their alcohol consumption by about 80% through mindful drinking and emotional sobriety. The masterclass is a two-part training series, so if you are interested, pause this episode and get into the show notes to register. You'll get immediate access to part one, which is how to fix the five thinking habits that are causing your drinking problem. And then once you watch part one, you can join me live on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern for part two, which is where I cover the seven core principles of emotional sobriety and how to apply them to overcome alcohol use disorder. I will go over my next chapter program at the end of the presentation. However, it is not just for people who are interested in working with me. You will walk away with a big picture understanding of the mistakes that you're making and the beliefs that are causing you to make those mistakes and then what you need to do different so that you can move through the change process instead of getting stuck and continually feeling like you have to start over. If you're struggling, this masterclass will illuminate the path from point A, party of one, hungover and super stressed, to point B, which is being able to drink and not drink like a normal person. So you no longer have to feel guilty or ashamed or argue with your partner or worry that you're going to lose control or that you can't stop once you start. So if that's something you're interested in, get in the show notes and I'll see you Thursday. Oh, and one more thing, I'm doing a 30-day challenge where I have to be on TikTok and I do three reels a day for 30 days to build my skills. And so I've started a new account. I am at Hangover Whisperer on TikTok. So come follow me over there and watch me and laugh because I do not know what I'm doing. But I'm not going to let that stop me. So I'll see you there if you're on there. And with that, let's dive into the interview. Helen, I'm so excited to have you on the show and introduce you to my audience and have this conversation about sleep. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do and how you came to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So I had complete burnout from a career in fundraising. I spent 20 years raising $50 million uh, for really awesome nonprofit organizations. Very proud of the work that I did, but I gave myself completely to it and um, ended up fully burnt out from it. So I took all of 2023 pretty much off and tried to find my joy and repair my health and get back my sanity, all of the things that I had lost. And 
in doing that, I realized that I needed more sleep to do that work, like that that was like actual healing work required sleep. And I was not getting sleep because I didn't have very good mental health state and we had a lot of really bad sleep hygiene practices. And so I was, I became aware of how valuable sleep was to me and how much I needed it and how I didn't know how to get it anymore. And that's when I created sleep lists for myself. Okay. So can you talk to me about the mistakes you were making? Like you mentioned mental health issues and it's only now occurred to me that I've had a lack of mental health for a good period of my life because I was performing and functioning and doing all of the things. So, you know, I understand sleep hygiene, but you might touch on that, but can you talk about like how your mental health affected your sleep? What did it look like, sound like? (laughs) <laughs> yes, I totally can. Um, so burnout uh, was depression and anxiety for me. And um, I did lots of things over a number of years to try and combat that. So I used alcohol to try to combat that. I used um, gummies to try to combat that. I used or uh, CBD or pot gummies. Yeah. Uh, and check, so, check, check. Me too, yeah. me too, me too. <laughs> yeah. huh? Like, um. And then I I also was just like, oh, well, I just need something on, like screens, right? Like, that'll help me. Or, you know, because you don't know. You don't, I I didn't know the science behind any of it. And honestly, most people didn't. Lots of people fall asleep to the TV. It seems perfectly normal. Um, So, yeah, scrolling on my phone, endlessly playing games, like really like match three, like Candy Crush. I was like level 7,027 or something, you know, like, so yeah, I had really... (laughs) <laughs> really bad, really bad habits um, that were not serving me. And I had lost, I completely lost the ability to self-soothe. So I would I would maybe have a routine at night and finally my head would hit the pillow in bed and my brain would, instead of powering down and turning off into sleep, go into like hyperdrive of self-criticism, um, everything that I didn't get done that day because I was so lazy and incapable of doing it, all of my anxieties for what's coming tomorrow and how terrible that's going to be. Um, like there was no living in the present moment. It was all this terrible circular um, thinking of self-sabotage and attack. So would other people have known that you struggled with what you're defining as mental health issues? No. Or was it just crazy town in your head and you walked around smiling and performing the role of yourself while suffering? Yeah, I spent probably four or five years uh, performatively, and I don't think anyone knew. It wasn't until the final year where I... I mean, it was in the middle of the pandemic. We were still doing lockdown stuff, and I couldn't hide from my loved ones that they were like, Hey, something's wrong. (laughs) Okay. And I was like, yeah, I think something really is wrong. Cause I've stopped feeling like there's any point to existing. So there probably is something really wrong. And I talked to my doctor about it and she helped me with some drugs. I got some therapy and I learned about the value of sleep. Okay. So the way your mental health symptoms presented to the world was what dark and twisty comments about nihilism or every once in a while no the only reason that my family knew was because I stopped being able to not snap at them when they would ask like the most normal questions like how you doing today and it would be like fine why do you ask (laughs) you know like (laughs) yeah "Hmm, maybe that's Uh a little more venom than we need for that (laughs) yeah so, so that's when it really were, were outsized. You had super outsized. outsized. Okay, got it. And my daughter mentioned it. She's like, "You're really cranky," and I was like, "Oh, like if we can't even like raise the kiddo right, like or you know hide from the kiddo, then we've got we've got problems that need addressing." <laughs> so how did you stumble into kind of the focus? of sleep. You know, it yeah. so- sounds like you saw a doctor, there was medication involved, there was talk therapy involved. Where did you come to identify sleep as kind of the foundation of the issue? That's a really good question. Um, it came in a couple of different waves. Uh, the therapist actually asked about it. it was like, how is your sleep? And I was like, sleep, mm, it's fine, whatever. And they're like, 
let's unpack that a little bit. And when we started to actually say out loud how many times I was waking up in the middle of the night, how many nights a week I was staying up until 3 a.m. or sometimes not sleeping until I took a nap that day. Like we started to really uncover. I was like, oh yeah, when I say this out loud, it doesn't sound like good sleep hygiene. It sounds really bad. And she's like, you're not going to be able to support the changes you want to see in your life without good sleep. And I was like, that's super true. So what is it behaviorally? I mean, you can't just turn off the anxiety. You can turn off the TV, but maybe then people keep it on because they think that it's actually solving a problem. So what actually did you do? What did this look like? Yeah. So at first it was just recognizing that there's an issue. I spent a lot of time scrolling on my phone. So I would try to like implement like no phone screens after a certain time or like put timers on it. And like I did for a while set up alarms, like a series of alarms that were just like, it's time to get ready for bed. No, really, you need to go to sleep now. No, seriously, stop it. And that's like literally what I named the alarms in like 10, 15 minute increments. Um, but then I'm just yelling at myself through my phone. Like, yeah, <laughs> that didn't feel no, I used to have healthy. an alarm that would go off at 10 p.m. that said, stop drinking, dumbass, and go to bed. Right. <laughs> I was like, like, okay. All right, I will. <laughs> you know, or I'd, or I'd snooze it and be like, okay, well, I was just going to pour another one. So, so, so what, how did you actually start to make changes? Because it sounds like you were just yelling at yourself through your phone. So please continue. Yeah. I yeah. So once I, so when I, once I really prioritized it, once I got it into my head that nothing else was going to change, like things were going to keep on being bad. And I had to, I knew I had to practice new behaviors. Like I'd have a conversation about how I needed to think differently and with my therapist or with my husband or with a friend. And then I'd fall right back into all my old habits because I was just too tired to do anything. So it, it really became like I couldn't learn. I was incapable of progressing forward without it. And so then I had to be like, all right, I actually really do have to get serious about this. And as I was also listening to lots of um science scientists and researchers who talk about the their work in sleep and there's now like a 15 20 year body of work about how important sleep was so I started listening to more and more people being like not sleeping will kill you like you will shorten your life or on the flip side if you sleep well regularly you can gain five years of healthy life like that's exciting so I really had to shift my priority and then I had to tackle the thought process in my head that was keeping me awake. And that's when I discovered, I tried a bunch of different things, right? I tried um, all the white noise, brown noise, green noise. Uh, I tried sleep meditations, sleep stories. Um, There's several very popular ones. So-and-so celebrity talks you to sleep. None of that worked for me. It was all too interesting. I was like, I just want somebody else to like count in my brain. When I was a little kid, I used to be able to like count myself to sleep. I'd count one to like 200 and I'd be out. But I couldn't do that anymore inside my own head. My anxiety and depression were just too big for me to do that for myself. They had too much root in my brain. And so I had to have an external voice do that. So I tried to find it, couldn't find it, made it myself, turned it into a podcast. Okay. So I want to cover this holistically and mm-hmm. the sleep lists are one p- component. So yeah. maybe tell me a little bit more about that. But then I also want to know about the supporting behaviors. You know, I know good sleep begins the moment I open my eyes in the morning, just yes. like sex, sex be- foreplay begins in the kitchen. You know, if you want sex right. later, like I know it's what I do when I wake up that's preparing myself to sleep well tonight instead of making up for the fact that I didn't sleep last night and blasting my brain with coffee and, you know, not moving my body because I'm tired. And then all of a sudden I show up tired and wired at night and just perpetuate the cycle. I know that no matter how well I slept, today is a new day. And now I'm acting to support tonight's sleep and just doing the best I can based on last night. So I do want to know the holistic journey of all the pieces, but go ahead and tell me a little bit, tell the audience about Sleepless and what that podcast is. Yeah. So for anyone listening who has trouble with that moment, your head hits the pillow and your brain turns on instead of turning off, that's really what Sleep Lists helps to support. So, and all I do is I recite 
um, single category curated lists of a lot of random things. So there's something there for everyone. There's numbers like I talked about. There's breeds of sheep. There's shades of beige paint. There's um, <laughs> breeds of dogs. I'm working on a list of breeds of cats for all my cat lovers out there. So there's there's a lot of stuff. There's presidents of the United States and their vice presidents. It's a very popular list. I don't know why it's so popular, but it is. Uh, people like that one and it, it puts them to sleep periodic table, like all of those things. So it's just, there's a little bit of something out there for whoever you are as your personality, what will work for you. But the idea is I very calmly recite these things at about 60 beats per minute, which is the heart rate, you know, your resting heart rate. I tell you, it's okay. I got you. You don't have to think about anything. I'm going to help you get there to sleep. And so that's what the whole list, like the whole show is about at you know, people listen all the way through because they've fallen asleep. That's the hope. Yeah. How long are they? One of my they vary. Problems, one of my problems is like I like to do yoga nidras on YouTube, mm-hmm. but if I don't turn off the autoplay, then the next video will come up and you know that it'll wake me up. Mm-hmm. Or I choose one that's too long and then it'll pull me back out of sleep or something. And so it's a really precarious. Like I don't always do them because of that. Um, I have to be pretty desperate to turn something on. So talk to me about yeah. that factor. So I, I know that it's different for different people and it was different for me throughout my sleep journey, what I needed in terms of length. So there are some that are short, like 15 minutes, and then there are some that go a full hour. Um, a lot of people like to use the ones that are full hours and they just start them in different places. The settings in your podcast player uh, can help you with that, like the next one starts and it pulls you out of your sleep. But I've actually had success stringing several of them together as well. Like if I know it's going to be a rough night and I really need to get my deep sleep, I will... And I know because like I'm super tired that day or like I'm cranky or like I've got a lot going on. Like it's what's ever happening inside my head really. It tells me what's going on. But I will string several of them together. Like I'll set them up as a little playlist and I will listen to them all so that I have like two hours worth of my sleep list. And I do listen to my own voice to fall asleep, which sounds weird, but it works for me. You know, you you bring, you said something there that that made me think – I don't ever know if I'm going to sleep or not sleep. I mean, there's times where maybe I had some coffee in the afternoon. And so I know that that I probably shouldn't have done that. And sometimes I link that, but you said something that made me think that you have become able to predict whether or not you're going to sleep tonight. Is that possible? Yeah. So I'm really aware of how busy my brain is. Um, And some of it has to do with like how off of my exercise diet schedule I am. Like sleep is really the third pillar of wellness, right? We spend three hours a day eating, maybe two hours a day exercising, but we need eight hours to sleep. Um, I also know if I'm having, um, for me, hormonal symptoms, those will oftentimes affect my sleep. So I'll know I need to be more attentive to the room temperature and what's touching my body when I'm sleeping, um, my clothing and the, the sheets. And so I will sometimes spend a little bit more time um, making sure that the environment is better for me. Uh, but if I start my nighttime routine and it's like, I'm just having trouble getting through it. Like my brain keeps on really turning on and I'm like, okay, we're going to need, we're going to need like some nights we don't need sleep lists at all. Sometimes we're good. It's awesome. I love those nights, but some nights it's like, I'm going to need some extra support. And so I'm going to pile on a couple lists and make sure that I'm ready to play them uh, when my head hits the pillow. You bring up an interesting point. So I did a sleep workshop last year and I watched all of Huberman's stuff. I, I read Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep. So, I mean, I don't want to say I'm a sleep expert, but I sleep pretty good. And one thing that I have trained my brain is, you know, when we wake up and we start thinking, like that's actually a symptom. It's not the content of the story in your brain. And what I have found is I'm going to go with four out of five times. If I wake up in the middle of the night, the first thought I think is I must be too hot. Like I've trained my brain to respond to the thought, oh, fuck, I can't sleep with you must be too hot. And four out of five times, if I adjust my clothing, 
change the room temperature because I don't know the science specifically, but it's something about our sleep is actually a state of consciousness. Your brain waves are at a certain frequency and that only occurs when your body temperature is at a, you know, like maybe one degree Celsius below your daytime. I don't, again, I'm not the science part of it, but I find that really interesting that that temperature can have that mm-hmm. profound of an impact and that training myself to, to question the temperature solved 80% of my sleep problems. Yeah. Your environment plays a super big role in your sleep. And so, I mean, I, I sort of, when I'm talking to people who are like, ah, I can't sleep, what's my problem? I'm like, well, you know, eliminate physiological stuff. So like, are you not breathing during your sleep? Do you have apnea? Okay. That's like something you got to fix physiologically, but are you setting yourself up for success in your bedroom? Like, is it a comfortable temperature for you? Is it a good lighting arrangement for you? Is your, um, you know, uh, does it smell weird? Are there weird ambient noises that you can get rid of by, you know, improving the seals on your windows or whatever it is? Like, really try to think about all your senses and everything that you're experiencing because those things do impact how well you sleep. And like you said, the, I mean, that temperature thing with the, with the, the sleep cycle is, is spectacular, right? Cause you're like, Oh, okay, absolutely. Once I know I just need to be colder, like, yeah, <laughs> that's great. And as, as women, as we age, like our bodies run hot sometimes. And so, you know, having, an extra blanket available for when you get really chilly and that you can remove when you get really hot is super helpful. Yeah. And it's, you know, really, and then you stop beating up yourself or being like, Oh gosh, what's wrong with me? Like nothing's wrong with you. Your body's just adjusting. Yeah. The thought I can't sleep or I'm not going to sleep because I haven't been sleeping. Like these thoughts actually perpetuate bad behaviors and we think there's nothing we can do to control it. And I'm still a little bit that way, except I have so much experience that doing the right things in the morning and when I wake up and I notice that it feels like there's an oven, there's heat coming off my torso, like, oh, that's why I'm not sleeping. It's not like some weird, complicated sleep just kind of takes on this ethereal, magical thing. Like you're just going to get lucky if you can sleep. And it's so much more than that. Exactly. You do have a lot of control and there are lots of tips and tricks and tools that you can learn to help yourself. Like, I don't think in this day and age with information at our fingertips, the way it is that anyone should be, um, like thinking, Oh my goodness, I, I can't do that. Or, Oh, that's magical. I'll never be able to understand why I sleep well or why I don't sleep well. If you're taking time to examine it, you can probably figure out some of your main issues and then also give yourself grace. Right. Cause like, there's nothing worse than that self-hatred that keeps you awake at night. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So give Mm -hmm. yourself grace. And like you said, like if you start your day out with like a big glass of water, that super helps. Like being well hydrated and appropriately hydrated before you go to bed can help your sleep significantly, but not like jugging, like chugging down a gallon of water right before bed so that you wake up four times to use the restroom. Yeah. You know, help yourself out, hydrate, like shift that hydration to the beginning of the day. And then you're better off at the end of the day. Also exercise. Like our bodies love exercise and it's a really good way to regulate our nervous systems, which can help us sleep. If exercise isn't your thing, meditation or both, either yeah. or, like all the tools that you find at all helpful to you, try them out. If they work, keep them. If they don't, throw them away and just keep that toolbox growing so that when you reach a point of crisis or difficulty or challenge in your life, you've got some, like, you've got more than one tool to reach for. That's been my hope and my work, like, all last year with my sleep was really finding more and more tools that I could work with that would help me sleep. And it was everything from switching up the amount of exercise I was getting and when I was doing it to the water and hydration, the, you know, environment that I was sleeping in, all of that stuff contributed. What other habits had to change for you, whether it be things you had to stop doing or things you had to start doing. Because I know like even just the exercise thing, when you're tired and running on a sleep deficit, like go fuck yourself with the exercise. Like I'm tired. I, I can't seem to do that. And so I know I've got some workarounds for that, but can you speak to 
dealing with the sleep deficit on a sleep deficit and what first small steps give you the biggest bang for your buck? Yeah. So, um, I don't know if, if everyone feels this way, but sometimes I'm like, I I used to be a student athlete as like a kid. Like I was, I worked out hard and like, what was the point of doing a workout if you didn't like sweat and like feel the burn and like, and as I've grown older, I've realized that there are other reasons to work out and my mental health is one of them. And so that means that sometimes I might have stacked up a pretty intense workout, but I check in with myself before my workouts and I'm like, do I actually have the energy to do this? And not like, can I push through and make it happen? But is this a sustainable thing? Like right now, how I feel, I'm exhausted. Like, I'm going to go into my workout and then I'm going to like completely deplete all of my resources and then I'm not going to work out for the rest of the week. Like I know myself. So instead I'm like, oh, I'm tired. We're not going to do a super hard workout. We're not going to try to set any personal records today. We're going to move our muscles and do essentially like a moving meditation. Like sometimes I'll just switch over completely to a yoga workout. And if yoga is your thing and, um, you are not feeling good, like just do a stretching workout. Like just, I mean, moving your body is important, but it's not so important that you shouldn't listen to your body before you go do it. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. No, I think that letting your body decide how you need to work out with a little assistance from your brain, as opposed to your brain driving the the crazy bus of, you know, what I need and I, I need to set a personal record or I'm not going to work out at all because I'm not going to work out for an hour. You know, all mm-hmm. of those things. Um, it, we have to adjust. And that's why I like the word movement Cause some days I'm moving in a run pace and doing all the things and other days, like I'm doing a couple sun salutations and gentle stretching because that's what my body needs. Yeah. And taking a walk, man, spending time outside is brilliant. Like even if it's just in your own neighborhood and you know, your own city block, whatever it is, you can find a little patch of grass somewhere and you can touch it and see it and just admire like how nature is progressing throughout the year as you take, you know, your, your regular constitutional, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Getting outdoors was a big part of my, um, my help too. I needed to spend more time outside. And why do you think that is? What's going on with that? Oh, there's such cool research about it. So like, there's really cool research, um, that's now like 20 some years old out of Japan, but that like, Anyway, the, 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 the basis of it was it makes you happier to be outside in nature. Like there's, there's scientific proof that being out in nature and the more you can get away from um, the noise of the city or whatever, the better. But even if you're in the city, just spending time with trees and nature, it is so good for your state of mind of happiness. Um So yeah, that's, so Japan's done research on it. There's like, there's, there's now it's been corroborated, you know, um, by a lot of different folks. And I think the bottom line there is that it forces you to take a little bit of pause and be present in the moment. And that for me, whenever I can spend a little bit of time and be present in this specific moment, that is when I feel a little bit lighter where I can, I can practice stillness and it doesn't come right away. I I was saying to somebody else recently that, you know, the first time I meditated, I sobbed. I was a mess, but being still with myself felt terrible and I hadn't cried for ages and like, it was bad, but I can do it now and I can be still with myself and I can go outside for a walk and I can, um, engage with nature. And, and so it, it, it's, it's a practice like anything else. Um, but it does help regulate your central nervous system. Well, and we're speaking a lot about a a concept that we refer to as mental health. But I know that I'm only now kind of figuring out what that is. Um, I think we understand mental illness in that, you know, psychosis, people, the story you're telling yourself isn't going to match up with reality and that's not working for you. But can you talk about how do you think of mental health? You know, what causes somebody to not be able to sit with themselves to where that is such a painful and uncomfortable thing? 
Yeah, there's a lot of things that can cause it, but it tends to be some sort of acute or chronic trauma that hasn't really been addressed. That's been my experience talking to people and, and my own personal experience. If you've, if you're essentially always keeping yourself occupied so that you're never spending time alone just with your own self and thoughts, chances are you're running from something. And that something was a big bad bear of some kind that you did not want to deal with. Uh-huh. So, so I think that that is where a lot of our bad behaviors can start and a lot of our breakdown of our mental health can start is we're, we're experiencing stuff that's really challenging and maybe not dealing with it well. And sometimes that's because there's another fire that we have to put out. Uh, and that's what chronic trauma is, right? Like any one of the little traumas was no big deal, but now there's like 700 of them and you've dealt with them all in a row and you're exhausted and completely broken now. Um, cause you've never had time to, to take care of yourself, uh, and handle it. And so for me now to answer your question about what mental health is for me, it's taking time for my own self and my own self care saying no to things that aren't going to work for me, even if they could be things that I want to do overall, but the timing isn't right, or I just can't put that much on my plate. You know, so actually saying no and not burning myself out that way. And then the other thing that was really important for me was to stop thinking about when am I going to be happy And instead start thinking about happiness as something that I can experience in small doses every day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, some people take a gratitude journal. Some people just talk with their partner or, you know, kind of just mentally assess for themselves. Like, what did I do today that made me happy? What did I see today that made me happy? Sometimes it's a funny joke. Sometimes it's a meme. Sometimes it's whatever the bird was doing outside my window. And That has helped me a lot because rather than thinking about happiness as this constant state that I need to somehow achieve the constant state of happiness, I've started thinking about life as a bunch of events, some of which make me happy, some of which help me grow, some of which do both, and really working towards appreciating those moments of goodness yeah. So that I have a better sense of how to how temporary the bad moments are too. I was in a place for a really long time where it felt like permanent badness. And so recalibrating my brain to see the happiness that interrupts the badness was a big part of my recovery. Okay. And so sleep actually is a big part of that. Um, with mental health. I think whether it's acute trauma or, you know, buried trauma or whatever, I also think that never stopping, that also can just be a habit and a way of life. And what I never realized is that we have to complete the stress cycle. It's not just, you know, all the stuff we're doing in our head and go, 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 but our bodies have, they, it, the autonomic nervous system turns on, the parasympathetic nervous system brings us back down. And if we're only living in the on, then we're like, I also use the words, it doesn't completely apply here, but like you have to balance consuming, do, 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 eat, 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 go, you know, with also creating Like you have to process the things that happen to you. And even if the things aren't happening that are bad, maybe your life's awesome and you're just going a hundred miles an hour. But if you never stop to make sense of the feelings you're experiencing, that actually makes it harder and harder. It's like not pooping. You get constipated (laughs) and sleep at night is actually when our subconscious cleans up, you know, takes the new, takes the charge out of really negative emotions. So everything always looks better on a good night's sleep. Well, that's why, because our subconscious actually is processing. So sleep as well as rests or breaks during the day, even 30 and 60 seconds at a time where you just ground yourself, come back to the present moment, touch base, if you will, and never let yourself get too far off of that base. I think just not reconnecting, the the longer you go between those connection points, sleep included, but also throughout the day, the, the more your mental health suffers. I completely agree. I think it's so cool what our body does during sleep. And I've really started to think about sleep as a productive part of my life. 
So if I'm missing out on sleep, I'm not giving my body all of its best opportunities and my mind all of its best opportunities. Like you said, we process our emotions. We process the events of the day. We process all the new information that we've learned. I I mean, I should have, it took me a long time to get here, but upon reflection, I remembered as I was talking about, as I was building my repertoire of things to say when I'm talking about sleep, I remembered a really cool case study that I learned or was exposed to in college. I took international studies, so I was like a, a big policy nerd. And there was a really cool side by side where they took real diplomats from various countries and gave them you know, a series of roles in a negotiation. And then there were the same events that happened. The only difference between the two groups was one didn't stop. No one went, no one took breaks. No one slept. The other group took just two hours out of every 24 hour cycle to sleep. And it was the difference between war breaking out where they didn't sleep and a peace agreement being met and things happening that were more productive for society. And I just thought that was so like thinking at it and reflecting back on it now, it's like, yeah, we can't be our best selves. We can't solve problems well for ourselves or for our others without good sleep. And so sleep is super productive and it helps us restore balance. Like that loop that you were saying, um, you know, like in the wild, you'll see predators and they expend all this energy searching for their food. But then after that, process there's a huge period of just like chill rest they've you know they've they've run their marathon and now they get to restore from it recover without sleep we don't get that recovery mentally spiritually physically so for anything that we want to do in our lives it's hard or challenging giving ourselves sleep is one of the best ways that we can make ourselves more successful at those endeavors Yeah, I try to remember when I tell myself I don't have time to work out, I don't have time to take a nap, I don't have time to take a break. Actually, you don't have time not to. Like if Mm -hmm. it's that important and this is do or die and go big or go home, like all of this, then you have to pace yourself because otherwise we do end up in burnout and overwhelm and we're not making good decisions. It's not just about how we feel, you know, and toughening up and powering through our own anxiety. You know, anxiety is a symptom of nervous system dysregulation. It's a symptom that you're not functioning on all cylinders, And so treating it seriously and, you know, just because you can keep going doesn't mean you should. And actually you'll do a lot better off. It's kind of like I say, if you need a new tire, like I've had a a nail in my tire and I just keep stopping and filling up the air instead of stopping and getting new, getting a new tire because I think that takes longer. And then, you know, three months later, I've been stopping every 20 miles to refill my tire and you just get sick of that. Like it takes less time to stop and rest than it does to pay the pay the error fees on bad decisions mm-hmm. and a lack of quality mental health and pleasure and joy in your life. It's just, there's nothing you're going after that's worth it. Well, and it doesn't no. work anyway. It just doesn't yeah. work anyway. You burn out. Yeah. You have to really prioritize what you're spending your time on and one of those things should be sleep. And if it's, I mean, it's interesting. I didn't, I was, you mentioned, you asked me earlier, like what were some of the things that I did and some of the things that I did to help myself sleep, um, was to just stay in bed. Like, like the requirement was to have an eight hour window that I was in bed, unless I needed to get up and use the restroom. I was in bed. I didn't get up and make myself a sandwich. I didn't get up and write a whole bunch of stuff down. It was like, no, you got to stay in bed and be off screens. That was the rule uh, that I set for myself. And it was interesting because it didn't take long. It was a real brief period during my restoration that um, and recuperation that I had that rule in place before it was like, oh yeah, I, I need to sleep. Like I'm, it's like, I just told my body it needed it. And it was like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I can do this. Oh, 
Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So you, you bring an interesting question. What's the timeline? So if somebody's listening and they're completely sleep deprived and they're like, fuck, I need to sleep. And yet I can't sleep without the TV on. I can't, you know, I'm up all night thinking about stuff. I have bad habits. Like what's the timeline that you can expect? Because I know for myself, I'm willing to not get, to not get a good night's sleep, or excuse me, if I didn't get a good night's sleep, I'm willing to have a shitty day about it, not pumping myself with caffeine and not doing the things that are going to keep me up tonight. Like I'm willing to pay that up front to sleep. But I know with a lot of people that are stuck in that cycle, especially if they're drinking multiple energy drinks in the afternoon because they're tired, like there's a, there's an upfront bill to pay. Can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So with my recovery, I was like, okay, I need sleep. I know I need sleep. I can't sleep at night. I had created really bad hygiene around uh, sleeping at night. I was just no good at it. And so I started taking naps. For me, it was um, taking the time to take naps. And it, they could be like 20-minute naps sometimes. And like so, so I think it depends on how far gone you are. Is it 20 years or 20 days that you haven't slept well, right? And how long, you know proportionally, it'll take you maybe a little bit longer to get back. But once I really internalized the fact that sleep was important and I needed it and I knew I needed it and I wasn't going to get better or see the changes that I wanted in my life without getting good sleep, then I was like, okay, it probably took three weeks, four weeks before okay. I started really having much better sleep hygiene. And it not perfect. It's still not perfect. And I still get, yeah. you know, hot flashes and like, there are still yeah. times, but yeah. I am no longer an insomniac. And that's yeah. a big deal to me. Yeah. I've learned what I can get away with. And occasionally it bites me in the ass, you know, or I know I'm yeah. making a bad decision and I'm going to pay for it. Can we just touch on medication and supplements? Like has, have you, and we don't have to get specific, but have you used supplement support or medications and what is your view on that? So really interestingly about sleep supplements in particular. So a lot of people swear by pot to help them fall asleep and I get it. It, it worked really well for me until I started taking a medication that didn't work well with it. But over time, that actually is not helping you produce the deepest levels of sleep that you need. Same with alcohol. Um, obviously, caffeine interrupts our sleep cycle. But like melatonin is the only one that I'm aware of that is because you're supplementing your own production. But even with melatonin, you have to take a break from it in order for it to continue to be effective. Um, and then there are sleep medicines, like medications to take for sleep and it's interesting because one of the pillars of are you suffering from a sleep disorder is can you sleep without medication support? So if you're using a medicine to get to sleep, and no shame at all if you are, because do what you need to do to get some kind of sleep if it's that bad, but working towards goals that you have control over without a bottle of pills is going to ultimately get you to a place where you no longer have disordered sleep. If you still need the supplements, you probably still have disordered sleep. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And there are a lot of supplements and some of the medications that you see commercials for actually, you know, you're not experiencing the REM sleep. Like I'm all about a good supplement. Um, I'd have to be really desperate. And like you said, no shame, but you know, some, the Ambien and some of the other things, um, those actually are not supporting the, the, all the phases of sleep or all the cycles of sleep. So in terms of mental health, you know, you're just basically kind of putting yourself down with sedation, but you're not going through the sleep cycles. Yeah. And in terms of like tools in your toolbox, that is like, okay, I'm in crisis and I yeah. need something now, but what can I do tomorrow once I've had this night's sleep to set myself up to not need it tomorrow yeah. night, right? Like, or, or, you know, working towards that goal of not needing it, um, except in a, a moment of real crisis, uh, just working towards having tools that you can have control over. Yeah. My awareness with myself, the rule is, um, am I using this medication 
to not change another behavior. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like if I know I had some caffeine, so now I'm going to take something to go to sleep. Okay. That's like, and like if I travel to the West coast, for sure, I'm hitting half a, half a something, whether it be a Xanax or my Benadryl or some other sleep supplement that I have, I have a, you know, pill bag full of those things. And when I travel, like, yeah, I, I'm on three hour time difference. I have no problem with that. But otherwise I will allow myself to use something like one night, but then tomorrow we're paying up. Like, what is it that needs to change? What am I doing? Um, If I need something to bridge that gap, I'll do it so I don't, you know, freak out or whatever. But yeah, I think that that's an important distinction that you brought up, that if you're still using supplements or medication to sleep, that there's still more that you can do and that actually that would be a good thing you know, um, to continue to look at where else you can be. And sometimes I'm going to be honest, it's also a mental thing. If you think you need something to go to sleep, you need something to go to sleep. That's a big thought hurdle to get over Mm -hmm. is this trust fall or, or that first night where you're like, okay, I'm not going to take anything. And then you don't sleep as well. Trusting that, okay, I'm going to be tired, but I'll sleep better tomorrow. It's a big one for people. And I get it. Well, and I had to practice falling asleep with naps. Like I totally practiced falling asleep with naps and thought about like, okay, how come I can sleep on the couch right now? Even though the daylight's here, even though I don't have my favorite blanket, like why is this possible if I can't do it at night? And like really thinking about like thinking where my head was and why I could make that happen. And I had gotten to a point where just going to bed was causing me anxiety because I was like, I'm not going to sleep. So I had to break that down and be like, I've got this skill. It works over here. I'm going to use the same skill over in bed where I can not hurt my back falling asleep. Yeah. (laughs) Sleep a full night. So what I hear you saying is in some ways sleep can be a skill. And it is. You have to learn and train your Mm -hmm. brain and learn in new contexts and keep moving the needle and expecting Mm -hmm. yourself to go from hot mess, party of insomnia, all the way to a well-rested, non-supplement-using person, like that's not going to happen overnight. So pace nope. yourself. Yeah. 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 You're not becoming a marathoner overnight and you're not becoming, a, you know, someone with a great sleep hygiene overnight. And every sleep coach that I talk to has bad sleep nights too. One of them, her expression is, we have bad days. Of course we have bad nights. Like <laughs> they happen. Um yeah. So just remembering that it's not linear. It doesn't mean you're failing. You know, your, your progress is not necessarily going to be linear. It doesn't mean that you're not going uphill. You are still getting to your destination. Well, Helen, I so have enjoyed this conversation. Is there anything I didn't ask you or anything else you want to share about your podcast? Oh gosh. Um, just that I put out about six lists every quarter and they're super reusable and very, um, highly effective for the folks that like them. So check them out, try them out. You just go to sleeplists.com or search for sleep lists wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Well, I might try your dog breeds. I'm not a cat person, but I can see that. So the cat one, the dog one came out first. So I've got, I've, I'm working on the cat one now and there aren't as many breeds of cats. So yeah. Try the dog one. It's good. Thank you, Mm -hmm. Helen. Take care. All right. Thank you so much for listening. If you appreciate this content, please try to find a way to share it either on your socials or just text a link to a friend who you know isn't sleeping. And if you have the time, you can rate me on Spotify or rate and or review me on Apple. And I really appreciate that also boosts me in the search engines and lets the algorithm know people are interacting with my show. So I appreciate you doing that. And then at least for the next few weeks, I'm just going to be posting back to my normal one episode a week. I've got so many fabulous interviews that I probably will go back to double time, but I just can't get them all processed. I mean, just getting this one up this week, it's all I had. So I'm going to keep doing what I need to do, taking care of myself so that I can get back to running on all cylinders. Thank you for listening.